Did you hear about the circus fire? No. It was intense. <laughs> they travel on the rivers. They travel on the rails. They travel on the air and in the on the sea. They travel the long distances through valleys and through vales to finally rest at their beloved's feet. Finally rest at their beloved's feet. Some of them are beggars. Some of them are kings. Most of them are somewhere in between. Sometimes they are lonely in their wandering. Still they're ever driven by the dream. They're the seekers. They're the pilgrims. They're the lovers. They're the children. They find their way to places where wise men fear to tread. They enter realms where few have ever been. They're helpless and they're hopeless and far less alive than dead. Yet the rest of their journey lies within. They sing songs of the new life, inviting calamity. They shun all worldly hopes, lusts, greeds, and fears. Their melody is suffering. They seek pleasing only God, cause the music of surrender is all he hears. Well, we're so happy to have you here. As I said, Charles, welcome. <laughs> Couldn't ask for, um, we couldn't ask for a better person to talk to us today about MRTP. So please, um, I'm just going to turn it over to you, Che Bava. Well, Jay Bob, everyone. And um, I'm so happy to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, once again for Baba Zoom and for all that you're doing to connect us uh, across the world. It's just a real gift. And Ruthie, thank you again for moderating and, uh, and being there and supporting. Uh, so, so kind of you. <clears throat> um, what I would like to do, and the reason that <laughs> the screen sharing was so important is because I want to share a lot of images uh, today. And so it's in my way of, what's that? It's good. Okay, Christopher says it's good. In my way of um, thinking about this today, I think of it more as a meditation and less a talk. Uh, let's see if that is how you feel about it. So, if you would, you know, any comments or questions and so forth, uh, and I hope you'll have them. We could we can do that at the end, just so that we can just stay with the flow of Baba's images during the. Uh, the time we're together here. <clears throat> I want to start with this slide because before I begin what I was going to share with you, uh, I just want to remember the wonderful people who Baba took to him this week, um, <clears throat> and including Donald Mahler pictured here with Baba in 1958. Donald is the tall one with the sort of little beard. Um, <clears throat> and I think all of you know about Donald and his great career as a dancer, as a choreographer. And you also know how much he loved Baba. Uh, he was one of Margaret Kraft's students, of course, and had the great privilege of carrying Baba during the 1958 Sahavas in Myrtle Beach. Um, Baba nicknamed him Donald Duck. And, uh, and I know many of you have known Donald and loved him over the years. Um, so we're happy that he is with Baba, but uh, he will be missed. <clears throat> I didn't know John Borthwick uh, well in Australia. I met him and knew of him 
uh, and know he was a stalwart in the Baba work there in, in Australia. Uh, and he, Baba took him this week as well. Um, and I know he's deeply missed by his wife, Wendy, and all the Baba family there. So I want to think of him. And yesterday, Baba, I think it was yesterday, Baba took Dorothy Cassidy to him. And many of you will know, know Dorothy and what a kind and loving soul, uh, someone who always uh, just made me feel good just to be with her and talk to her and love Baba so much. Um, and someone you may not know, but um, Sandy Washburn also passed away this week and he did not participate much in the Baba community, but he grew up in the 50s across the street from Del Ruba. Uh, well, actually it wasn't Del Ruba then, it was just the center. And he used to go on and play on the center. And he has a memory of seeing uh, Erich and Baba walking together <clears throat> during one of the gatherings. I mean, that's, that was his, his childhood memory. Anyway, Sandy in his heart really loved Baba. And, uh, and um, so I wanted to remember him today. So the, those four <laughs> joined Baba in this week. And, uh, and I know that they are in his embrace now, Jay Baba. So Baba says, I am nearer to you than your own breath. Remember me, and I am with you, and my love will guide you. I am nearer to you than your own breath. Remember me, and I am with you, and my love will guide you. I wanted to begin by sharing this amazing picture uh, that is on David Fenster's site of Baba rescuing Mera from a stumble. It seems so dreamlike, doesn't it? And it just touches my heart so much, this, this photograph. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll just have to live with the fact that the internet goes in and out around here, but um, that's all right. Uh, Baba, Baba, <laughs> Baba doesn't go in and out. <laughs> uh, what? Oh, okay. All right. Um, anyway, I was just saying that this seems like a, a dream like photograph, and, uh, and you know, it, it makes me feel how Baba is always near, always ready to help us when we stumble in our lives. And, um, and Mara, of course, being the lover, representing all of us and Baba the beloved. Such an unusual, uh, beautiful image of Baba. Amartithi, of course, is a, a word that I think Baba coined, but it's sometimes said to be eternal date. It's sometimes said to be deathless day. It's sometimes said to be date with the eternal. <clears throat> For me, though, uh, Amartithi is best captured by something Elizabeth said soon after Baba dropped the body. <clears throat> It, I happened to be in back from college after Baba dropped the body, and I was um, called over to Del Ruba by Elizabeth. Her minister had come to visit. He had heard that Meher Baba had passed away, and like a good minister, 
he came to pay a pastoral visit and to, um, you know, comfort. And so she called me over because we would go to church together. And so I, I knew him and we sat there in the living room and he, he was very sweet. He said, you know, Mrs. Patterson, um, I heard that Mayor Baba passed away and I wanted to come and say how sorry I am. And, you know, and I know that uh, how much you're going to miss him. And Elizabeth looked up with a little surprise in her face and said, oh, oh no, you see, he's so much more available now. In the last years of his physical life, Baba really led up to that availability by secluding himself, by withdrawing. And um, in a way, Baba revealed in those last years that absence is presence. What do I mean? The deeper Baba went into seclusion, the more he was present because we, he had to be, means we had to hear him inside. We had to become more aware of his, his living presence. So he was, I guess, preparing us, you could say, um, but I think he was also preparing the world, you know, for the withdrawal of his body and the release of his love in a, in a different way, a new way. So, you know, people would write to India for some work and Baba in seclusion, it was very rare. You really couldn't write it. Sometimes you couldn't write at all, but when you could write, it had to be specific and for work. And of course with Elizabeth, there was always kind of the exception. She could write more than others, but she didn't take advantage. And she only wrote when it was very important. And if she'd asked Baba something during those last years, uh, Baba would inevitably, or Mani, or would send back and say, Baba says, <clears throat> do your best. Do what you feel best for Baba, and I will be there with you, helping you. And so it was that that inner guidance, that inner that inner experience had to be cultivated because he was releasing himself as he was withdrawing his physical presence. I, this is a photo from during that period of time when Baba was in that deep seclusion. And <clears throat> I want to ask Eric. Erich, you know, and this was in the 70s, I guess. I said, Erich, you know, there were people uh, towards the end who so many people wanted to see Baba. So many people wanted to meet him in his physical form, long to see even a glimpse of him. Why do you think he didn't do that? Why do you think that was the case? They long so much to see him. And uh, Erich looked at me and he said, that's why. I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah. He said, yeah, you know, and this somewhat paraphrasing, but how I remember he's saying, you know, the more he withdrew, the nearer he came. And their longing was what brought him near to them. It would not have been the same to have seen him then. He was more available in their longing. And you know, seeing the deep love that so many have for Baba, who came to him during that period and who've come to him since, and their deep awareness of Baba, even though there's always the sense, well, I, I would love to see Baba in the form, but the deep awareness, the deep 
sense of his presence. I understand now what Erich meant. Because of his advent as the God man, Baba is more available now. And because he is God, he is always available in the now. Everything Baba did in his lifetime as Mayor Baba, he tells us, had only one aim, to awaken us through love, to see him as he really is, our true self. This reminds me of an incident in 1962 at the East West Gathering. And here's a, a, an image of, of Baba with the Westerners just outside Gruppersad. <clears throat> this incident took place inside one morning. And uh, as I recall it, Baba was talking about, you know, seeing him as he really is. And Baba was saying it's important he wants us to long to see him as he really is. <clears throat> and then Baba looked at us and he asked, would you rather see me like this or as I really am? And of course, I don't know what others were thinking, but I, I, and maybe they were, <laughs> everybody looked a little abashed because maybe they were thinking what I was thinking is, is, is you know, I, I think this is, this is what I want right here, Bob. <clears throat> but Baba just said, long to see me as I really am. But, and so he asked the question, would you rather see me like this or as I really am? And we knew the right answer. We just didn't want to say it. And Baba asked a couple of people, you know, and they tried to, you know, say, oh, Baba, you know what, I want to see you as you really are. You know, they tried, but it was kind of awkward. And then Baba always, uh, you know, could depend on Anita. So uh, he turned to Anita and he said, Anita, would you, would you rather see me like this or as I really am? And she said, without hesitation, both Baba. <laughs> and and, and Baba laughed because he, he could always depend on Anita to bring levity and also truth, you know, uh, both Baba, both Baba. And Baba said, yes, Baba said, yes, Anita, you, but Baba said, uh, you, you can't have both. I want you uh, to long to see me as I really am. And then he paused as we all kind of looked down and thought, okay. And then Baba smiled and he added, yes, but I know this is wonderful. And we all felt very relieved. Now, Baba in 1962 gave me one glimpse, a shadow of a, gl of a glimpse, I guess. Uh, of, of what a taste, if you will, of what it might be like to see him, might mean to see him as he really is. <clears throat> so I'm gonna share that story and it's one I've recounted many times, uh, but I feel like for me, every time I recount it, it seems new because it reveals something wonderful about Baba. And I think Baba does that. I think he takes these stories and he, he uses them to say something new every, every time. At least that's how I feel. <clears throat> Sitting on the veranda of the turf club, I overhear several young girls talking excitedly about walking early the next morning to Gurupasa. Not only will they arrive long before anyone else, but they will also be first in line when the door opens for Darshan. Determined not to lose my spot next to Baba, I ask if I can accompany them. Only if you get permission, they tell me. We asked Mara and she said yes. If anyone can grant exemption from the rule not to arrive before the appointed time, it is Mara. 
Baba's closest disciple, woman disciple. Well, since men cannot speak to Mira or even be in her presence, I feel stymied. During lunch, I barely eat, struggling to come up with a plan. Then it hits me. If Mera can give permission, then perhaps Erich can as well. After all, he is, or so it seems to me, the closest of the men disciples. Better still, Erich will be on the platform this afternoon during Darshan. Maybe during a break in the program, I can take him aside and ask for his help. Well, the plan seems far-fetched because <laughs> Erich is constantly busy caring for Baba but I can think of no alternative. When we return to Guru Prasad that afternoon, I'm filled with anxiety about approaching Erich. What if I take him away from his duties? Will I disturb Baba? But the specter of losing my front row seat the next morning steals my nerves. I am, always have been, a shy, self-conscious and introverted child. Few things are more difficult for me than going on stage in front of thousands of people. So I stand on the side of the platform and I'm watching Baba give darshan. It's that extraordinary flow of love from the lover to the beloved, back and forth. Erich, as usual, is by his side, adjusting the pillows on his chair, reaching down to remove garlands and fruit placed at his feet, wiping his brow when needed, translating gestures whenever Baba pauses the line to speak to one of his lovers. I am struck by how seamlessly Erich anticipates Baba's every need. He appears to move instinctively as though he is in tune with Baba's rhythm. Then Baba holds up his hands to stop the darshan lines, women on one side, men on the other. He signals for the musicians gathered on the stage to begin the bhajan. Erich takes a few steps back from Baba and stands alone with his arms crossed. Now is my chance. I quickly go up the steps on the side of the platform and rush over to Erich. In a rush of words, I explain my dilemma and ask if, if he can give me permission to walk early to Guru Prasad the next morning. Well, Eric looks at me and says nothing for a long, uncomfortable moment. Is this a mistake, I wonder? Should I not have asked? <clears throat> After all, it is Baba's order that we arrive at a certain time. Finally, Eric shrugs his shoulders and looking helpless, says, what can I do? It is not for me to answer. If you want permission, you must ask him. My heart stops. What have I done? Go, Eric says, pointing to Baba. Ask him. With legs shaking, palms wet, I cross the short distance with Eric by my side and stand next to Baba. Eric says to Baba, Charles has a question. Baba looks at me expectantly. Baba, I begin, but the words will not come. I start stammering something about walking early with a group of girls. Seeing my discomfort, Erich rescues me by speaking to Baba in Gujarati, no doubt giving a coherent version of what I'm trying to ask. When Erich finishes, Baba looks at me with a very serious expression on his face. Then he looks up at Erich and shrugs his shoulders as if to say, what to do? 
Suddenly I'm conscious of thousands of eyes staring at me, likely wondering what the weighty matter I brought to Baba, what the weighty matter is I brought to Baba's attention. And Baba prolongs the agony by stroking his chin as though this was the most difficult decision imaginable. Finally, Baba looks at me and with an emphatic gesture says, granted. <laughs> Only then do Baba and Erich break out into enormous smiles. I realize that Baba is enjoying this trauma, teasing a very shy and serious boy on an urgent er errand. I smile with happiness and great relief. <clears throat> to seal the deal, Baba beckons me into his arms for a warm embrace. As dawn breaks the next day, our little troop heads out for Guru Prasad. The girls seem to know the way as we navigate winding streets in a residential neighborhood of Pune. After a brisk walk of about 30 minutes, we see the entrance to the garden surrounding Guru Prasad. Without crowds of people lining up to take darshan and various booths set up with Baba's books and photos, the garden is serene and lovely in the cool morning air. We walk quietly up the steps to the veranda. From behind a side door, someone signals for the girls to enter. Mara is expecting them. And although they do not say much about it, I gather they are to have tea with the women Mondly. I am just as happy to be left alone outside the large French doors, the entryway to the hall where we will soon be with Baba. I will be first in line. After a few moments, I am curious to glimpse what the space is like when empty. I gently lift the cloth curtain covering the doors and peek inside. <clears throat> to my great surprise, I see Baba sitting motionless on the sofa at the far end of the room. Dressed in a white sadra, Baba has already arrived and is waiting for us. Worried that I might be disturbing Baba, I quickly put the curtain back in its place and step back from the entrance. At that moment, Rano Gailey, one of the women Mondly, enters the veranda from a side door and comes over to me. Charles, she says without any introduction, Baba wants you to say good morning to him. And then she goes back inside, leaving me standing there a bit stunned. Somehow I have the presence of mind to take off my shoes before opening the doors to the hall where Baba is seated. I look across the room and Baba is looking directly at me. No one else is present, no Mondali, no interpreter, no devotees, no one. <clears throat> For the first time, I am completely alone with Baba. To say good morning, as Baba has asked, I need to walk across the expanse of what suddenly seems like a very large room. Slowly, I make my way toward Baba under his steady gaze. I am so self-conscious that my legs feel shaky and I have to will myself to put one foot in front of the other. It is, I later decide, the longest walk of my life. After what feels like an eternity, I finally reach Baba and stand before him. I remember why I'm there and manage to say, good morning, Baba. Baba smiles and nods his head. 
I look into Baba's eyes, he, he looks into mine. Nothing is said, I have no words, and Baba, of course, is silent. No one is there to interpret his gestures. Baba stares intently into my eyes. I find myself dissolving under his loving gaze. My mind empties. I am there, but not there. Only Baba is in the room. No one and nothing else. All encompassing, complete. A glimpse of Baba beyond Baba that becomes the touchstone of my life. How long do I stand before Baba? I have no idea. At some point, Baba breaks the spell by opening his arms. <clears throat> I bend down into his embrace, inhaling his sweet, familiar fragrance. Then Baba gestures, time to go. Dazed, I somehow managed to back out of Baba's presence and return to the veranda. <clears throat> Live in the world, wrote St. John of the Cross, as if only God and your soul were in it. I alone am real, Baba says. All else is zero. When I look out at all of you, Baba once told the gathering, I see only Baba, Baba, Baba. How liberating it is to contemplate this truth. There is only Baba, Baba, Baba. is available now, in the now, because he is all there is. Our love for Baba and his love for us gives Our love for Baba, his love for us. All right, we'll just give Charles another minute. He'll be back, I'm sure. Hmm. There he is. Charles? Okay. Charles, you need... Okay. There you go. Okay, Papa. There we are, yes. Um, Sorry, here we are. It's all right. You just kind of uh, faded out when you were speaking of um, Baba's love for us and our love for him. But of course, our veil of ignorance keeps us from experiencing his presence in the now. Erich once told me that Baba told them, when you go, 
I come. Now we believe this. And then we go about our daily affairs as though they were real. And Baba in 1962 quoted Hafez saying, the universe and its affairs are nothing into nothing. I don't know about you, but I, I like to say that every day, <laughs> whether I experience it or not. If I say it, I'm reminded. Well, Jay Baba, we're all being reminded. We'll just give Charles another minute. Back. Yeah, uh, I've got to share a screen again. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> universe and its affairs are nothing to nothing, including the internet. <clears throat> <laughs> but it rules our lives anyway. <laughs> uh, you know, in the 1970s, I guess, or 80s, maybe you had this experience too, those of you who went to India during that time, that when, when I would leave uh, Meherazad for the last time after my visit, and Mara would come out and say goodbye, and, you know, Maybe she would give me something so sweet. And she would say something like, um, almost always say something like, Charles, hold Baba near. Keep Baba near. Now, of course, Mara didn't mean find Baba somehow and then hold him near. She meant, Charles, keep constantly aware that Baba is always near. I am nearer to you, Baba says, than your own breath. And so the do nothing that you would not do in his presence really means do nothing that you would not do if you were aware of his presence. You know, I was thinking the other day, I mean, maybe we need uh, in the Mayor Baba community the equivalent uh, of Elf on a Shelf, you know? Uh, you know, Elf on a Shelf, I mean, the kids, my great nieces had this. And you, you have a little figure of an elf and it moves around at night to different parts. Of the, and the idea is that Santa Claus uh, can't watch you all the time, but this elf is there and reports back to Santa anything you're doing. So I was thinking, well, Maybe we should have, uh, uh, you know, Mondly figures and we put, put them in, in our different rooms to, to remind us that Baba is always near. It's probably not a very good idea, but it's just, it, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm making a joke of it, but it's a serious thing. You know, Baba is always with us. He's always present. And so to, the idea that do, do nothing that we would not do in his presence, well, actually, he's always present. It's that we're not aware that he is. And would it be too much to bear if we were aware? You know, I mean, what would we be, would we be paralyzed? So of course we can't always have that awareness. We, uh, you, you know, but when we tap into it, uh, uh, you know, so I was saying that the awareness of his presence um, is overwhelming. But it's not that Baba is present sometimes and not present other times. It's the awareness of his presence that uh, that is the practice, in other words, of the presence of God. It's the practice of the presence of God.
And so I was thinking, and, and this is be the last part of my sharing or this meditation, I was thinking, um, how do we practice the presence of God? And of course, we all know that the most important thing Baba gave us was to remember his name. Because of course, he imbued the name with the power of his ad entire advent. So Mayor Baba contains all that he did, all that he uh, transformed through consciousness is in, contained in the power of his name. So it's not just saying his name, it's actually invoking the whole power of Mayor Baba's advent by saying Mayor Baba. So that is, of course, the most significant way to be, Baba tells us, not my idea, to practice the presence of God. His name is the most, is the incomparable gift of love Baba has given. Because it is the gateway to awareness that he is always near always near. So how do we cultivate the awareness that Baba is always near, beyond remembrance? Well, in the barn in 1958, at the 1958 Sahabas, Baba gave a guide to this. Now this image of Baba in the barn with Christopher's help, you know, we were looking yesterday for an image of Baba in the barn, and there are not many. So we went back on David Fenster's site and found this photograph, which had not been there before. So it must have been recently put up by David, maybe from Darwin's collection, because I know he acquired that recently. I don't know. It is a blurry but amazing image of Baba, a rare one, of Baba in the barn with us in 1958. And to my astonishment, Baba gave me this very wonderful gift. There I am. I had no idea that there was an image of, of me with Baba in the barn. This is the first, yesterday was the first time I'd ever seen this. So I'm standing on the right in my white shirt, the same white shirt that I'm wearing when Baba embraced me outside the lagoon cabin. And I believe next to me in the white scarf is my mother. Anyway, there we are. And in the barn in 1958, Baba gave for the first time in the West, my wish. Which in my reading of it is a complete guide to cultivating constant awareness of Baba's nearness to each of us in our lives. So much of Baba's wish for his lovers is about cultivating awareness of his constant presence, <clears throat> his nearness to us in every moment. In the barn in 1958, Baba had this my wish read out three times. <clears throat> he said, it's very important to listen to this carefully and to do this. Actually, after the first time he had it read out, he called for some jokes, typical of Baba. So to break the atmosphere, the serious atmosphere, he had jokes. And then he had it read out twice more. Baba said, the lover has to keep the wish of the beloved. My wish for my lovers is as follows. One, <clears throat> do not shirk your responsibilities. Two, attend faithfully to your worldly duties, but keep always in the back of your mind that all this is Baba's. This is Baba's way of saying, be in the world, but not of it. And always keep in the back of your mind that all of this is Baba's. 
He's not only near, he is the all of us. When you feel happy, think, Baba wants me to be happy. <clears throat> when you suffer, think, Baba wants me to suffer. How freeing this is. This is all what he wants. And four, be resigned to every situation and think honestly and sincerely. Baba has placed me in this situation. Baba's not somewhere else. Baba's not remote. Baba doesn't have to be reached. Baba's right here and now, and he has placed me in this situation because ultimately he is me. Five, with the understanding that Baba is in everyone, try to help and serve others. For me, this may be one of the most important of the points Baba gave in his wish, because serving others is in fact a way to be near to Baba. He says this over and over again. Love others, serve others, even at the cost of your own happiness. This is to love me, Baba says. This is to love me. And finally, I say with my divine authority to each and all, that whoever, so whosoever takes my name at the breathing of his last comes to me. So do not forget to remember me in your last moments. Unless you start remembering me from now on, it will be difficult to remember me when your end approaches. <clears throat> you should start practicing from now on. Even if you take my name only once every day, you will not forget to remember me in your dying moments. At this very moment, right now, beloved Baba is fully available to us. Baba is as near to each of us right now as he ever has been or ever will be. It is for us to become aware of his nearness and experience the joy, love, and peace that flows to us constantly from the divine beloved. I am nearer to you than your own breath. Remember me and I am with you and my love will guide you. J. Bob, everyone. J. Baba Charles, thank you. That was so, so moving and so beautiful. Okay. I'm sure everyone felt the same way as I did. I'm going to um, just go ahead and unmute people. If you have anything you'd like to say, um, a question or something that you might want to say to Charles, then um, please try to raise your hands because it just makes it easier since there's so many of us. Um, I just put in the chat, or I'm trying to, how to raise your hands. Uh, we do this by hitting Alt-Y on a PC, Option-Y on a Mac, Star-9 on a phone, and there's a little reaction button 
that uh, you can click and find hand raised. And uh, Marta, are you first? Yes, Go thank ahead. you. Charles, dear, um, I wanted to ask you, when Baba, when you, Baba says, uh, think Baba wants you to suffer, I have a little bit of issue with that. I don't understand. I don't believe Baba wants us to suffer. Could you just open that box a little bit for us? Well, yeah, I mean, no, I, I, I understand what you're, sh you're sharing. And of course, I would, I would say you're right. Baba doesn't want us to suffer and he doesn't want us to invite suffering, needless suffering. He says that in his discourses. At the same time, Baba says everything is the will of God. Yeah. Um, everything is the will of God. So whatever happens to us, Baba says, is the unfolding of the will as it emerged in the original whim. There's no two wills or three, you know, so all that is happening and unfolding is the will of God. So I think that's what Baba means when you are happy, think Baba wants me to be happy. Remember that this is all God's will. If I'm happy, it's God's will. If I'm suffering, it's God's will. It's not that Baba is giving us suffering. It's that the unfolding of Baba in us, right? The unfolding of our awareness of, of that we are Baba, that we are, that he's our true self, are all of these things that we consider happiness, all of these things we consider suffering. And yes, of course, that's real to us. Baba says that. Of course, you, 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 you can't live you know, with the idea that this is all God's will. It's too, too much. You, you experience it. You make decisions. You make choices. You try to you know, do what you can if you have an illness to, to help yourself to be, you, know, you do your best. And that's the first thing. Do not shirk your responsibilities. That's our responsibility, to care for ourselves, our, our loved ones, do the things in the world, Baba's called worldly duties, that we are called to do. But, Baba says, do you want to be free? Then just remember, this is all mine. You call it suffering, it's mine. You call it happiness, it's mine. Yeah, you're free. I like many of you spent time with Mondly people, you know, after Baba left the physical body. And of course, Kitty and Elizabeth all those years. And I, I can tell you that, and you may have experienced this as well, they never gave the sense that they, you know, <laughs> that they're happy or that they're suffering or, you know, except that it was all what Baba wants. I mean, that was just like breathing. I, mean, I can't even imagine Elizabeth ever thinking this is not what Baba, you know, what I'm going through is not what Baba wants. She, her baseline as it were, was always, if this is all what Baba wants because it's all bringing me closer to him. What is it that I'm happy? It's to bring me closer to him. What is it that I feel suffering? It is to bring me closer to him. So that's, I think, what Baba means. Not that he gives us suffering, but he wants us to become aware that we are beyond suffering. And the only way to do that is to remember this is all his will, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. That's just beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Baba. Yes. All right, anybody else? This is your opportunity. That's a hand? <laughs> That's a real <laughs> hand. No, I, it isn't. I just, 
<laughs> oh, Lynn, hi, Lynn. Hi, Charles. So good to see you. And see that was you. such a beautiful talk and such a Thank beautiful you. response to that question. And I just had one little tiny thing to add to it. The other day, I don't know, I was suffering with something. And that reminder that Baba wants me to suffer was so helpful to me because I realized I was not alone in my suffering, that Baba is with me in it. And that was just another angle that um, I appreciated having an awareness of. Thank you. That's beautiful. And, and you know, it makes me think, I mean, let me just say, first of all, I would never personally say to anybody who loves Baba or anybody else, Baba wants you to suffer. Baba said it. So I, I, give, I, I give it out because I don't know. But I'm saying what he says. But the other thing that you remind me of when your comment is that for me, and this is speaking very personally, it is liberating. Just like you say, it's liberating because, uh, and, and again, people suffer a lot more than I do. So I certainly understand that this is not something you one can say about anybody else's experience. But for me, it's not only Baba wants me to suffer, it's Baba has recently given me this, this gift of being grateful for what I suffer. And I, I don't know, what, you know where that comes from, except it's a gift, it's grace. So I think of Mara, who suffered far more than I can even imagine not only in the accident, but in her last years, Erich, who had such suffering, you know, physical suffering and all that. And, um, and how, you know, happy they were. Grateful they were. I mean, that, I don't, I, I'm not speaking for them. That's my experience of them, is how grateful they were for what they were going through because they knew it was his love for them. Well, I see people are taking some advantage here, Charles. We've got three hands now. <laughs> Elizabeth, you wanna go first? Sure. Good morning. Good morning, Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Charles, I was extremely, I've been a Baba lover a long time. I live in New York and in Maribad, actually. But one of the things that struck me in your talk, which I found deeply, deeply moving, was when you spoke about Baba taking you in his arms and you smelling his fragrance. Can you describe that for us? I found that very meaningful somehow, very real, made him such a real person that he had a fragrance. Yeah. Well, I can only say for myself, um, when, for me, fragrance with Baba was not just a smell, if you will, like a perfume. You know, I know that Mero, you know, sometimes would put perfume on Baba and all that. So there was that. But fragrance for me was something else. It was this Baba atmosphere that when I would come into his physical presence, even across a room, there would be that fragrance. I don't know what else to call it. Um, it's in the air. And it is, it was for me undeniably Baba, right? <laughs> it's in fact how I 
was reassured that Baba was Baba <laughs> when after 58 and so many years of being with Baba inside, you know, as a child and then going to India in 62, the reassurance that I got that this Baba that I had been living with inside is the same Baba, right? That's sitting in the chair was when I entered Guru Prasad for that first morning with him and it hit me, you know, this fragrance, what I call, maybe call atmosphere, I don't know, but it seemed to emanate from him. And it was so familiar and indescribable, but it was, all I can say it was undeniably Baba, right? Nothing else was like that. And it seemed to have to do with that form that he, something emanated for me. I can't say for anyone else. And so that's what I meant, you know, when I'm, when he took me in his arms, you know, that just breathing it in because, uh, because it was, uh, it was like breathing him in, I can't say. Mm. And, you know, it's like breathing him in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Baba. Hey, Baba. Ganesh? Yes. Thank you, Charles. Every time we listen to you, you connect us to Baba so intensely. So your talks are like real pressure for us. Thank you so much. So my question here is like, I know you're very close to Elizabeth and Kitty. So how did they observe the Amartiti day? I mean, what was it to them in terms of more on the internal connect? Was it another usual day or they were like deeply connected to Baba? I mean, how was it for them when it came to, when, when the Amartiti day, day came? Especially okay. with Elizabeth and Kitty. Yes, well, uh, you know, in some ways it was, they were always the same. I mean, I know that sounds odd, but Elizabeth and Kitty were, were two people who, in my experience, you know, they were always putting Baba first. And in that sense, every day they exemplified for me anyway, that Baba is there, Baba is available. And the times that I was with them on Amartiti, which was not often because I was somewhere else usually, in college or whatever, but the times I was with them, my feeling was <clears throat> that they were remembering and celebrating that he is always there. In other words, it wasn't a day of sadness. It wasn't, you know, heavy. <laughs> uh, you know, they never, you know, they, that was not, what Elizabeth and Kitty, they, that was not their approach at all. Their approach to it was what a wonderful thing to remember that he is with us. He is with us. He is with us. You know, that's what MRTC, that's where I got this notion, you know, as growing up with them, is that MRTC is, Baba is available. He's here now. And in MRTC, we celebrate that he made himself available. That he did all that work in his life, all that he went through, to make himself available now. Or as Elizabeth used to say, Baba is in the now. So that's how I felt they experienced MRT. Thank you so much, Alex, that helps. Baba. Well, Charles, I heard this one time and I'm sure it's probably myth, but I'll <laughs> ask you <laughs> because it's, but of course, Elizabeth, I had heard, uh, woke up hearing, I know my Redeemer liveth. 
which I had sung at my wedding because it's such a beautiful song. But um, I heard this. I heard that Kitty said, what will Baba think of next? When she heard Baba drop the body, I guess during the day of Anne Martithi that in 69, somewhere through the day that she said, what will Baba think of next? So I think I probably- Could well be, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was in Atlanta at that time. And uh, so it was a long distance. I'm not sure what Kitty said that day, but yeah, but that, that sort of sounds like <laughs> Kitty. <laughs> I loved it too. Uh, well, we have Annie here. Che Papa Annie. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Thank you, Charles, for your for your talk. I'd just like to add something about suffering. Um I think that part of it for me is remembering that we're here to become our true selves, which is Meher Baba. And that um, to do that, we have to clear our karmas and we have to balance our sanskaras. And so we cannot not suffer because we've got to balance those sanskaras. I think Baba made that very clear. And so it's like a parent, a parent who wants us to get to our ultimate true potential will cause their child to sometimes have to suffer to do that, to get to where they need to be. You know, a, ch a child doesn't want to go through exams and studying, but their parent wants them to go through exams and studying so that they can learn and that they can reach their potential. And so Baba as the perfect parent allows us to suffer, to give us that opportunity to become our true selves, which is Meher Baba. And so the terms that I hear used are, he unwinds our sanskars, we have to unwind. So when I suffer and when my husband and I suffer, we say, oh, Bob is unwinding us. Um, and there's a quote that somebody said that, you know, we're, Baba will grind you until you crack. And so we say that also, Bob is grinding me until I crack. I'm cracking, Baba. Do you want me to continue to crack? And so there's a bit of a humor in it. And there's also the understanding that Baba is our true parent and our true self. And he wants us to get to that. And if we never suffer, we can never get to that point because we will not have balanced our sand scars. And it may take many, 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 many more lifetimes, or it could be this last lifetime. We don't know. And so um, that's just an addition to the comment on suffering and how to handle it better is once I'm done with this part, this part, I won't have to maybe do it in the next lifetime. I maybe won't have to do it anymore in this lifetime. I don't know. but. I know I can't get to my ultimate goal and Baba's ultimate goal for me if I don't go through this. Anyway, just thought that that might help. Yeah, that well, thank you for sharing that, Annie. Well said. I, uh, you know, not only just put a footnote and say, um, we, we, it's good to remember that Baba suffers through our ignorance. And if our suffering helps to end our ignorance, that relieves his suffering. And after all, what is his suffering but our suffering? So we think, oh, this is my suffering. But our real suffering is Baba suffering in us because of our ignorance, <laughs> because that's who we are. He tells us, you know. So yeah, the more we are relieved of our ignorance, the less Baba suffers. That's what he says. Hey, Bob. Hello. Thank you, Charles. That was, that was lovely. Thank you. There was a, a quote that came to mind when you were speaking, uh, the Baba light from Hafez, which is, uh, Baba says, on this Hafez has said, if you want your beloved to be present, do not absent yourself for one moment from his presence. If you want your beloved to be present, do not absent yourself for one moment from his presence. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Thank you. It's amazing how Baba could quote Hafez so much. <clears throat> oh, oh, he was he was Avatar, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> 
but actually he, he memorized things, <laughs> he said. <laughs> well, here's Andy. Andy. Hi, Charles, thank you so much. Uh, that was such a beautiful talk and it really was a meditation just like you, you wanted it to be. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to add something on suffering that um, is that I always remember when I would talk to Bao and unload about my suffering, he would always smile at me and say, oh, you are so lucky. Baba loves you so much. <laughs> so that's one thing. The other thing is, just to, this is just by, by way of advice, is that last year I was musing to Baba and thinking about all the suffering in the world and remembering how Baba said lovers of God suffer. And I thought, I said to Baba, Baba, maybe I'm not suffering enough. Okay, never do that. All right, <laughs> that's the thing. Never, ever do that because that's a big mistake. <laughs> Just to let you know, and I'm not going into it. <laughs> and that's it. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Candy. Okay. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Malini? Hi. Hey, Charles. How are you, Jay Baba? Ooh, Jay Baba. Um, I actually, um, it, it's more of a, maybe a commentary. Um, two things I really in, liked hearing when others added. One was to, and also you, was to, to know that when you are suffering, that Baba's right there with you suffering. And also uh, the imagery of being ground and cracked and it kind of reminded me of what happens with stones <laughs> and it's turned into powder and dust and and i also sort of equated that with the suffering and the stone with the ego and having that being ground and powdered uh for as somebody said so that you can progress and so both of those i thought were really good metaphors to to what is happening to you at uh, maybe a spiritual level is really getting powdered uh, and having your ego powdered. Yeah. Yes, thank you for sharing that. That's so true. All right, this is it. Last opportunity. If anybody wants to raise their hand, please do it now. I think Winnie is raising her, her waving. Oh, Winnie! You have Jay to unmute. <clears throat> you have to unmute, Winnie. <clears throat> yes. There you go. It's so great to see you. Good to and, see you. And it, 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 your, huh, your whole presentation was so meaningful to me. So I really appreciate it. Thank and you. I would just like to say hi to everybody there because <laughs> they're people I haven't seen in many years. But um, I'm reminded of being cheerful and being, you know, Baba said, even if your heart is cut to bits, let there be a smile on your face. And, and that smiling, giving a smile to somebody is just, a great gift to them from Baba. And um, I just remember how Mani was. She was always cheerful. Yeah. So, um, yes. That's she just was. the brighter side. Yes. Well, <laughs> you know, it was very challenging, I think. You know, it was uh, the, the year that Baba said to them that in the ashram, you know, that. <laughs> They had to be cheerful. <laughs> it's the hardest thing he could order, you know, to yeah. always be cheerful. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, the backbiting and the ego, all these things, and much less the travails of daily life. It's, you know, it's easy to forget to be cheerful. Yeah. 
fortunately in, in my life, I had a wonderful role model uh, in my sister, uh, you know, because uh, Baba gave her the gift of cheerfulness. Uh -huh. And um, from, from childhood, whatever she went through, she was able to be funny and cheerful and to others, you know, even when she was suffering very, uh, a lot, you know, and she, she's had a tremendous amount of uh, suffering to deal with, you know, physically and all that. <clears throat> and, and in other ways, I mean, it's not been easy, yeah. but she's always, oh, you know, almost always cheerful. I mean, I'm, she would say if she were here, oh, I'm not always cheerful, but, you know, she always rises to the occasion. And I, I've always felt how much that must please Baba. You know, how much that must please Baba. Who, who just loved a cheerful face. There, there she is, <laughs> who loved a cheerful face. And, um, and so she's kind of been my role model for that and as well as for, as for other things as well. But, um, so um, Ruthie, uh, I know you're gonna wanna wrap up here. I wanna say, uh, I just wish I could capture all these beautiful messages uh we'll send them to you if you'd like oh thank you i appreciate that because sure. they're so beautiful and i haven't had an opportunity to to respond but everybody you know sent such lovely lovely things and you know i feel a little embarrassed because it's all bob <laughs> and i and i get the credit or a little credit you know but i don't i don't <laughs> but you know what i mean i mean that's i'm not saying that because i'm humble you know, I'm saying it because it's true. And uh, it was so funny because recently we had a, had a meeting with some people, a, a center business and something, and, and someone said something about how, you know, we give spiritual understanding. And one of the things the center does is give spiritual understanding. And I said, no, we don't. <laughs> and, and this person took umbrage and said, yes, we do. You've been doing it for years. And I said, actually, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't given any spiritual understanding in my life, but Baba lets us share him. And in spite of us, he comes through. And I'm so grateful because it's such a gift. It's such a gift, you know, um, such a gift to share him and let him speak for himself. You know, Baba needs no one to interpret him. <laughs> He's, he speaks. And, uh, and so that's been such a joy. So I appreciate everyone saying this because what you're really saying is thank you for trying to be transparent to Baba. Thank you, Charles, for trying to get out of the way enough so that Baba can come through. And, you know, to the extent that's true, I'm so grateful to Baba. And so, Ruthie, in our final silence, would you like me to show some photos of Baba? Sure, that would be that, wonderful. That we haven't seen yet, you know, yes. so we can be silent looking at his photos. And, and as we as we enter into silence, my sister, speaking of which, forwarded to me somebody had recirculated this uh, saying of Rumi, which uh, I love. And, and Rumi says, silence is the language of the beloved. All else is poor translation. <laughs> All else is poor translation. Uh, so as we enter into silence, let me see if I could share my screen again. <laughs> Here we go. You know, I'm going to learn this before I die. Can you see them? Uh-huh. Yep. There you go. There you go. So let's see. <clears throat> so let's all just enter into silence with Baba on this blessed MRTT time. <clears throat> Jay Baba.
J Baba, everyone. <clears throat> J Baba. J Baba. People J like J Mayor Baba. J Avatar Mayor Baba. J J Avatar Baba. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. 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 Oh, so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this week. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. My good fortune. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Wonderful. Hey, Baba. Thank you, Charles. Hey, Baba. Happy Amartiki. Happy Amartiki. Happy Amartiki. Happy Amartiki. Happy Amartiki.